Imagine you could step inside the minds of Canada's healthcare leaders, glimpse their greatest fears, strongest drivers, and what makes them tick. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast where we talk to leaders about the joys and challenges of driving change and working with partners to create the safest healthcare system. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast produced by HEROC. I'm Ellen Gardner with Michelle Holden and Philip D'Souza. Our guest, Brian Goldman, is a longtime staff physician at Sinai Health System and a podcaster, host of White Coat Black Art on CBC Radio 1 and the CBC podcast, The Dose. He's also the author of three books. Many people who read his most recent book, The Power of Teamwork, have an aha moment when they realize that they're not actually working on a team, but a group. As Brian explains, many teams flounder because the members of that team are more focused on individual goals than team goals. They haven't had much input in even setting those goals, and they don't help one another. Whether it's in healthcare, the military, aviation, or a corporate environment, for real team problem solving to happen, Brian says everybody must feel safe to say what they see. That means breaking down longstanding hierarchies, taking chances, and leaning into uncertainty. Welcome, Brian. It's great to have you on Healthcare Changemakers. Congratulations on your book, The Power of Teamwork. It's, it's just a great read. Near the beginning, you talk about the importance of asking questions and follow-up. And I know from experience, the phrase, tell me more, usually opens up a whole new line of thinking. But most people don't do it. In fact, most people don't ask enough questions. And if they do, they don't follow up. So how can we teach people to get better at asking questions. I'm so glad that you've started there. I'll answer your question, but I, I also want to, to back up and, and highlight the what I think is the core issue that what keeps people from asking the question, tell me more. Tell me more is all about leaning into uncertainty. And I imagine that Somewhere in the implicit rules of, of being a, a leader uh, is uh, the phrase or the admonition to, to kind of eradicate or stamp out or minimize uncertainty. By, and, and, you know, I, I think there's many reasons for that. But one of the reasons, one of the big reasons, I think, in healthcare is that we tend and, you know, I'm still I'm still a, a practicing emergency physician. I think we tend to be in a hurry. We operate as if we're in a hurry. You know, I'm finding that as I get older as an emergency physician, when referring physicians are on the phone and I'm dictating, like I'm, I'm scribbling notes about why they're referring a patient to the emergency department, they, they talk fast. Everybody talks fast. Everybody wants to, you know, cut to the bottom line, get to the answer quickly. Let's move on from this meeting. And that is death to... Uh, a team meeting. And, and so, so, you know, what, what Ellen, what you're asking is, is a really profound question. First thing we have to understand is that we have to accept uncertainty. And when it comes to making a, di- and, and of course, Herox should be very concerned about this because, you know, we all know about cognitive errors. We all know the many reasons for cognitive errors and, and, and one of them, and, and that lead to mistakes that, that lead to hospital disasters uh, and disasters by, you know, you know, medical errors, that um, we hate uncertainty so much that we prematurely close conversations. And it's never either or, either we lean into uncertainty or we don't. You can have a mixture of both. You can, sp- you know, practice uncertainty by just sprinkling a bit of it in there. Just, just hold on, just, just pause for a second if you're about to say, let's close this discussion off or table it for another time. Um, to to ask questions like, tell me more, um, you know, what do you see that makes you say that? And then when that person has had an opportunity to say what they see, ask the rest of the group, what more can we find? And by doing that, um, I guarantee you, you're going to have a better result. Raising the issue of uncertainty is huge because I think that's the intimidation factor and why a lot of people, whether they're in a healthcare environment or a corporate environment, are scared to speak up or ask a question. You talk about that yourself in your own in your own healthcare training, how you answered a question once and were completely humiliated. 
So it's, I, I can see how it would be very difficult to get people to be open to even raising something that's a little bit, yes, out in left field. I guess the first thing we, we want to engender, I think, when it comes to teamwork, if you want to get to team cognition, team problem solving, and, and, and I think teamwork is necessary for any endeavor inside or outside of healthcare that's complex and patients are complex there you know, we're all recognizing complexity as as a major part of what we do so so you, you want to be able to engender that so to so you want to have a situation whereby everybody who is identified as being on the team either the core team the people you work with or the broader or and 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 often including the broader team of people who work in those other silos that we often don't talk to and don't listen to or they don't listen to us and we don't listen to them because we're kind of pursuing our own agendas you want to create an environment where everybody feels safe to say what they see that means to give us the benefit of their observation from my standpoint this is what i see you know, I see, you know, it could be, I, you know, I see that this treatment plan that, that's, been, that's been developed in the last 10 minutes has a, has a flaw in it. Um, and it might be a medical student saying that, you know what, the potassium is supposed to be elevated. And I, I, I just looked at the chart and the potassium is, is actually low. And I don't understand why that, why that is. If you don't want to know that there's a problem there, then you're the problem. Because, you know, the whole point of risk management and quality control, quality improvement, continuous quality improvement is to ferret out mistakes. And the only way you're going to ferret out mistakes is by discovering them. This is Philip here. And I think your, even your first response, Brian, it had so much to unpack. I feel like that you covered off probably, probably three or four of Ellen's questions. But I want to just dig deeper into the point about leaning into uncertainty. And uh, you're absolutely right. I feel like we are in a sound, kind of a sound by culture. We want to hear one thing and next, next, like move on. And you're absolutely right there. But is there, in your you know experience, is there one thing people could do to lean into that uncertainty so that people feel comfortable and they're like, you know, I think we all know in healthcare things sometimes could move slowly so to get people on board. Is there something you do with your team or you, you've done with, uh, you know, it's just in your in your 40 years you said, of, uh, of working in healthcare that you do to help others and yourself lean into that uncertainty? I think that team leaders play a paramount role here. I think what they need to do is just change the, the, the meeting, you know, change the nature of the meeting. Um, you know, I, 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 I've had meetings off site. Um, I think that works. Um, basically I, what I learned from Alexa Miller, uh, um, and, and the whole, the whole concept of visual thinking strategies, I think has really changed my approach because I not only use that, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes, uh, uh, take the group to, to look at art. Um, and, and, uh, by the way, you don't have to, you don't have to go to an art gallery to look at art. There's works of art in, in many hospitals. So you can just take them down, you know, down to the, to the, to the, to the hallway where there's, there's, there's works of art and just ask them those questions. What do you see? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can we find? But you want to get from that to a clinical problem and, and immediately show the application. Cause I think it has tremendous application. That's why I wrote about that. I talked about Dr. Joel Katz. Uh, taking students who have just been to the art gallery and take them to the bed, and he takes them to the bedside of the patient and asks the same questions and gets better results. There is another thing that you can do, and that is just to practice the improv technique that I talked about in the book called "Yes and." So you know, a lot of you know, somebody suggests an idea, and and somebody else in the group immediately says, "We tried that last year and it didn't work," or uh, you know, I I can cite ten papers to say why that won't work. Uh, and, and that has the effect of shutting down that person ma- and making them feel foolish. Instead of doing that, say yes and. So, so that means accept what that person has said and try to build on it. You know, Brian, what was amazing in your book was how your journey took you to so many different realms, art, theater, music, games, the military. You've, you've just alluded to some of those experiences now and, and all the incredible people that you met and the, the different points of view and how it really it changed your whole philosophy around teamwork and around what needs to happen in healthcare. Did you know the journey was going to take you in such amazing directions when you started on this project? 
I never know where the journey is going to take me when I set out to write a book. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it took me to some amazing places. And this gives me the opportunity to uh, to shout out the members of my team. I, I recognized early on that the only way I was going to write this book would, would, about teamwork was to assemble a team. And, you know, there was a larger team, but the core members of the team were uh, Aaron Byrne and Emily Mathieu. They're both journalists. They're both working journalists. What I was looking for, you know, the book, I, I, I thought that the best way to tell to tell the book, to I wanted to be not identified as an obvious management book. I didn't want it to be about management theory. I want, and there are lots of books like that. I wanted it to be a storytelling medium. I work in something called creative nonfiction. So what I what I try to do is tell stories. It's 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 the same thing that I do on 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 my radio show on White Coat Black Art. What I try to do is paint a picture of what the room is like, and and give people reading the book a sense that they're in that room. So I wanted them to help me dig out some some wonderful stories. And you know, if you read the lengthy acknowledgement section, yes, <laughs> uh, you'll know that I did not come up with all of these stories. You know, certainly to me, the Rosetta Stone was meeting Alexa Miller at .md at 2019, and and eventually forging a, a friendship with her. Uh, I think she's terrific. I think the world of her, and I think the visual thinking strategies uh, really deserves a much stronger public airing. And I hope I hope the book helps to get that. Hey, if you're a regular listener of our show, you'll know that we don't really do ads, but I promise this one is worth it. So please excuse this interruption to your car speaker or earbuds as I let you know that registration is open for the 2022 Hero Conference. This year's event takes place from October 17th to 19th. You can't wait that long. When you register for the Hero Conference, you'll have the option of signing up for a special virtual tour of FM Global's research campus on October 12th. This one's for all the property and facility enthusiasts out there. Our conference theme this year is all about looking forward and doing it together. Future forward together. Subscribers can look forward, see how I did that there, to three days of fast-paced virtual learning. We've got an agenda packed with change makers in the healthcare space and beyond. And as always, our event is complimentary for Hurox subscribers. We'll place the link to register in the show notes for this episode, or you can find it on all of our socials. We can't wait to see you there. One of the things that you talk about is you know, flattening the hierarchy to encourage a diversity of thought in the team. And yet that does set up a little bit of a contradiction because you do need strong leadership on a team. So I'm thinking about, you know, the one of the crises you talked about, the Swiss air disaster, when they had to set up a temporary morgue in Shearwater, Nova Scotia. And Trevor Jane, he he came across as such an amazing leader. And, and yet he never said, you have to do things my way. So In your view, Brian, what qualities, you know, made him a strong leader and that leaders can demonstrate without being, you know, so so authoritative and considering that they you should be flattening the hierarchy? Yeah, Trevor Jane um, was an important person uh, to meet. He's he's an incredible physician. Trevor Jane um, came to that experience with the right skill set at the right time. He had pathology experience. He had worked as a pathology assistant, had been paid first as a volunteer, and then he was paid as a pathology assistant at a, a, at a local hospital in the Annapolis Valley. That gave him the, the, uh, the experience and, and information that he needed to set up uh, one uh, autopsy suite and then ultimately 12 autopsy suites uh, and nobody else in the room uh, had that. Nobody else in the hangar had that when he arrived the day after the the Swiss Air 111 disaster. So, so he had his experience. He as 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 a member of the Canadian Forces Reserve, he had military leadership experience. But he was an exceptional, and he is an exceptional leader within the military. He is uh, somebody who. Uh, who explain to me the principles of team leadership in the military, you know, the core ones. They are knowing every member of your team, knowing something about their background that tells you what their strengths are. You have to know the superpower because you have to position them to, to function on a team 
that that brings out the best in them, that doesn't keep asking them to do what they're not best at. Uh, and to do that, you have to move the pieces around. So you have to see how things fit together. Um, you have to, once you, you, you know their superpower, you have to know their vulnerabilities. And, and one of the things I found really touching about, about Trevor Jane was that uh, at those moments when they had the, the unfortunate task of having to identify the remains, the DNA remains, the, the tissue remains of infants and children, and there were infants and children on the flight on Swiss Air 111, he made certain that uh, the people who were conducting the autopsy at that point were not parents of young kids which I thought was, was such empathy. It was such a demonstration of empathy. That's another thing. So he had empathy. One of the reasons why he had empathy, and I wrote that whole other book, The Power of Kindness, um, and, and you know, in that book, I was looking for the most empathic and kindest people on the planet to, to tell their story and then ask how they got that way. One way you get that way is by being downtrodden yourself, knowing what it's like to be put down, ignored, and and as as I talked about in the book, Trevor Jane is a BIPOC physician who knows what it's like to have been bullied uh, and and in fact, harassed and tortured. He was beaten as a as a teenager. He had his homework stolen from him, ripped up. And and that gave him tremendous empathy for anybody in the room who might have an opinion, but would be afraid to ask or would habitually not be. Uh, canvassed, not be asked their opinion. And that included a, uh, a maintenance worker uh, in the hangar who he encouraged to be part of the conversation. And once he did that, this person was very reluctant to speak up, but once he encouraged them, uh, he never looked back and this person became a member of the team. So those are some of the, those are some of the attributes that, uh, that Trevor Jane brought to team leadership. One of my observations coming out of the book was that Many of the people you talked to had trained in two very different realms, a car mechanic becoming a doctor, a doctor becoming a pilot. And of course, I thought of you because you've always had different and concurrent careers as a, you know, as an ER doc, a journalist, and now recently as a podcaster. So, and I'm sure this is something you've thought about, but do you think having a foot in different careers teaches us more about operating effectively in teams? You know, I think it does. You know, I talked about in the book, I talked about the the value of, of this kind of crossover wisdom that if you that, that people should seek out the advice of those who are not in their own domain, in their own silo. Um, you know, if you find people in your own silo or, uh, you know, you know, you're in a silo if 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 you tend to see the world as insiders and outsiders, you know, in groups and out groups, which we do naturally, but that's a stress response. That's a response to feelings. If you're under pressure, under stress, nobody understands us like us, like, like us, certainly in reflecting on my own career. Uh, I knew nothing about um, empathizing with patients uh, until I became a medical journalist um, and started telling stories on, on the radio of, of, of patients, what it's like to be a patient, what it's like to be um, a family member of a patient in the culture of modern medicine, and uh, you know what it's like to be on a gurney uh, for you know you know in a hallway for four or five days. You know, I like a lot of us in healthcare, we tend to walk past those patients without considering what it's like to be them. On a more elemental level, I learned to communicate. I learned how to communicate to patients in a way that didn't diminish what I was saying, but made it easier to understand. And you know, part of that is you know, decades of experience as a medical journalist. I, you, know, you don't use jargon. Jargon is often a dodge for communication. You ex just use common words that people, that people can understand. Um, you know, the highest compliment people can tell me when they, when they uh, listen to me is that they feel as if I've taken them in, into the world of medicine, you know, to my side of the gurney, and they understand more than they did before. For me, it, it, the, the variety, being able to bounce from one realm to the other has certainly sustained me. And, and it, to me, it's, it's, one of the, uh, it's one of the things that, that immunizes me from burnout. So you have a podcast too. In fact, The Dose and White Coat Black Art. You've written three books now. You continue to work as an ER doctor at Mount Sinai and you have a family. So the obvious question, Brian, is how do you do it all? Uh, you must be busy all the time. Um, I am. 
and uh, I'm I'm busier than you think. You know, I've been uh, dealing with a close family member who uh, has early onset dementia, and uh, I've become that that person's caregiver. And uh, so, and I've 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 entered into um, un, to me, un, un, an undiscovered country of, of guardianship issues and, and discovering just how difficult to be, to become the power of attorney as recognized by a financial institution. If you, if you aren't the power of attorney, uh, becoming one on behalf of somebody who has dementia, uh, who can no longer sign documents, uh, is, had presents its own challenges. Uh, and then, and then there's you know, getting to the point of personal care, of providing some degree of personal care. So, you know, how do you do it all? Um, you know, so I have a greater sense of crisis now than than I've had uh, uh, in earlier parts of my life. Although, you know, I, 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 you know, there are times when, not to be overly dramatic, I, I probably, you know, as an emergency physician, I probably draw, I, you know, I probably thrive on 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 crisis. But even I have had to come up with some rules for coping, and I've come up with three or four of them. One of them is um, perfection is the enemy of good. Now, I didn't invent that phrase. Voltaire invented that phrase. And I've had to learn to not be a perfectionist. And at the end of the day, I ask myself, uh, are things better for my, for my involvement? And if they are, then I, then I say, good, you did a good job. Um, I, you can't do everything. And one of the things that I've learned how to do is to observe closely the things that I hate doing or I can't do, uh, the things that are the most soul-destroying tasks, and I and I try to hire somebody to do them on my behalf, or I recruit somebody, beg, borrow, or steal, um, find somebody to do them instead. And the third rule is don't drown in their sorrow. If somebody else is, if you're, if you are trying to take care of somebody who's in the midst of a crisis, um, you've got to take care of yourself. And emotionally, that means you have to find ways to take care of yourself. And I discovered a fourth rule along the way, and that is embrace the power of teamwork. Because without <laughs> teamwork, you can't do this. You cannot, you can't build a bridge. You can't build a nuclear power plant or a submarine or, or a brand new opera center uh, you can't, you know, you can't cr- create a volunteer activity like Habitat for Humanity without a team. You can't, you know, and, and you can't take care of, of somebody who can't take care of themselves without that. You can't be a parent without embracing right. a team. <laughs> well, one of the stories in the book that really struck me was when you talk about the military and how one of the military people you profiled had ventured into healthcare and discovered one of the prime things they do in the military is they look after their people and that making sure that they're, you know, they have, they're well rested, they're well fed, that that healthcare doesn't seem to do a good job of that looking after people. (laughs) What is that all about? You know, when, when Brian Ferguson said that, it was like, God, he's right. (laughs) <laughs> like, and, and yeah, you know, Navy SEALs take care of, you know, they, the, once you, you know, they, it's grueling to see if you can pass the threshold for, for, for self-immolation and, uh, you know, for, 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 uh, for masochism. But once you, once you pass that trial by fire, they take care of you. Whereas here we kind of make it an ongoing thing and almost a badge of merit. Uh, you know, I, and, and it's as recently as, you know, I did a, you know, night shift a couple of days ago when uh, I was. Uh, you know, called in two hours early because it was really busy because we're going through a real, really hard time. Emergency departments right across Canada. And and uh, my first instinct was to kind of talk about it triumphantly as a as a as a badge of honor. I got called in two hours early, you know, 11 o'clock shift. I was called in at 9 p.m. That's not a badge of honor. That's terrible. And and the fact is that I still had to do my job, although I have to tell you that the person I uh, I handed over to at nine o'clock the next day um, was um, I'll name him Dr. Sean Hardy. What a great guy. He's young enough to be to be my kid. And he you know, he's he's one of the newest hires in our group at Sinai Health System. And he said, I'm going to make sure that that, you know, whatever you need to hand over to me so that you can go home and get to sleep. I guess what I'm saying is we know what we need, but we find it really hard to extend it to one another. And you know, let me talk about nurses. I mean, nurses really feel starved for um, respect, affection, appreciation of what they do. And they're, they're voting with their feet. And if we don't see, you know, if we don't see just what a crisis 
uh, that that has visited upon us right now, then then you can see that there are some system wide issues. Maybe some of them are political. Um, you know, the political will to 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 deal with uh, you know to hand, to 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 take care of the core issues, um, and uh, that's going to require some teamwork as well. You talk about this in the book, and you have alluded to it in our conversation. How has learning about teamwork, really diving into it and writing the book, moved you from being a solo act? From I alone to, to, to we together. Um, you know, it's, uh, I had to overcome, you know, I, 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 can certainly, I can certainly appreciate as patients have become more complex that um, I savor those moments when I've got, when I'm working with a nurse practitioner um, in a kind of a dyad, which is like this, you know, a two person team, which is the smallest team. Um, and we're kicking around ideas and, uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, there's a particular, uh, nurse practitioner I worked with, uh, the other day on that night shift. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't all night. It was just in the first two hours. And I really appreciated how she, Carrie, uh, Carrie can, she also happens to be a flight attendant. And uh, so she, maybe she gets this in a way that other people don't, that, that we kind of enhanced each other. I firmly believe that medicine has become so complex that there is no I alone anymore. We can't, we can't understand everything, know everything. I can be, you know, I, I've discovered that I work better in an environment where I can be prompted in the, you know, in, in, res, in resuscitations, nurses prompt doctors all the time. Oh, wasn't he allergic to that? Oh, I thought he was allergic to that. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, or, um, mm, you know, a nurse who says, mm, I haven't seen it done that way before. That's nurse speak for don't do that, Dr. Goldman, because that's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, if you're smart, you pick up the hints. And, and that's teamwork. That's what teamwork's all about. One more question I have for you. You talked about, um, and I really like that Ellen brought it about the you know crossover wisdom, and and that's something Ellen's taught me, and we practice that a lot at Hiroc as well. And I know my my, my team, my personal team, we do that as well. We do talk to other people from outside of the sector because we do find lots of, uh, you know, seeing a new lens. Is there some piece of um, really interesting, I guess, I guess something that really helped you, where you learned something that you know you're not usually done in healthcare, but you learned it from outside of healthcare? Alexa Miller and visual thinking strategies. And, uh, and okay. that completely turned me around because I instantly saw the application at the bedside and in the resuscitation room and in the operating room. If, you know, a, a, the central story in that in the book, uh, the core story is the story of Elaine Bromley, who had can't intubate, can't oxygenate or can't intubate, can't ventilate. And, and it was unrecognized. It went unrecognized. Um, a nurse, uh, two nurses recognized it. One said, we've reserved a bed in the ICU. This was a patient who was supposed to go home from routine surgery in two hours. They don't go to the ICU. And then the and a second nurse said, I brought the surgical airway in. And if, if they had practiced those, like if, if one of those three, you know, two anesthetists and, and one surgeon had said, uh, what did you see that makes you say that makes that made you bring this tray in? Uh, well, the oxygen saturation is at 42% and it's been at 42% for the last eight minutes. Um, then they might have there might have been a different outcome that day. So so yeah, visual thinking strategies. That's mine. Very good. I'll pass it back to Ellen for our closing. <laughs> well, the final part of our interview, Brian, is the lightning round. We just ask you a few questions and just tell us the first thing that pops into your mind. So, what's the most interesting thing you've learned from a book recently? From the uh, the spy who knew too much. Um, that a mole could exist in the Central Intelligence Agency uh, planted there by, by the Soviets and function there for 20 or 30 years. And uh, the, uh, you know, the people, the higher ups at the Central Intelligence Agency at the CIA uh, kind of e erected barriers to, to, to discovering who the mole was, some of them unconscious. What's one thing we can't guess from your LinkedIn or your Twitter profile? That in a parallel universe, I was a Hollywood screenwriter. What? Wow. <laughs> I want to know more about that book, Ellen. You continue. <laughs> so outside of your own, of course, Ryan, what is your favorite podcast? The Ezra Klein Show. It's my, it's my deep dive show when I go on a long run. It's been harder these days because I broke a bone in my spine about nine months ago. It, it's healed, but I'm, well, it hasn't healed, but, you know, it's a, it's a little spicule of bone, but, um, 
Uh, yeah, the Ezra Klein show, because uh, he uh, deals with uncertainty. Ezra Klein is, is a great interviewer, and he's well-read, and he takes you deep into some of the most important issues uh, going on culturally in the United States, and you know, politically, they're, they're dealing with a with, you know, they have threats to democracy. Roe v. Wade was overturned and, and uh, you know, there's the rise of populism. And uh, but occasionally he interviews sci-fi writers, too, which I think is great. Thanks for that. A company whose culture you really look up to. I'm going to get the name of the company wrong. Um, it's Tadar Grancharov's company. Um, it's the company that uh, developed the OR Black Box it's an open concept company that where anybody, it's a fairly flat hierarchy. Um, Taylor Grancharoff um, set it up that way so that he would have ah, outsiders talking to each other. You know, he would have, he would have uh, computer programmers, uh, 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 artificial intelligence experts, deep learning experts, uh, being able to talk to surgeons and talk to residents and uh, everybody, nobody's afraid to say what they see. I'm going to ask what's the best piece of career advice you've received, but also what is the advice that you give to other people when it comes to their career? Catch yourself um, liking something or not liking something. In other words, don't just run to, to, uh, to get past the moment, but, but catch yourself you know, saying things like, I hate this, I can't stand this, or... Uh, I really love this and, and use that as a guide uh, for what you should pursue. I like that a lot. I like that. That's a good, I'm going to use that. I'm using that. But back to the Hollywood thing. I always, I always <laughs> wanted to ask, I always wanted to wa- ask, um, you know, um, people who work in healthcare. I obviously, we all, everyone watches TV, I'm assuming, and movies. And, blah, blah, blah. and there's this show called New Amsterdam. And I, I don't know why I like it. I like it so much. And I always wanted to, I, and our team, we always wonder, like, what do, what do people who actually work <laughs> in ER, in a hospital, what do they think about a show like New Amsterdam? And what, what do you, have you watched it? Brian, have you seen it before? Uh, you know what? The topics were are so earnest, and and they are so close. You know, they're so close to the kinds of things that I do on my radio show that I'm looking for. I'm looking for total escapism. And and you know, right now I'm I'm watching The Old Man. The uh, Old Man yeah. is Jeff Bridges and uh, yes. Amy Brenneman. It is it is just a tour de force. I, I like to watch all the Star Trek series. And fortunately, there are a number of Trekkies amongst my friends in emergency. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to say, but when you, uh, in your, when, when you dabbled in screenwriting, did, was, there a, was it a specific something um, that, was that, that you're passionate about that you were writing about? I wrote a script that never got, that never got produced. Um, and it was, uh, it was about, you know, a series of murders taking place in a hospital. Um, I, uh, wrote a spec script for Star Trek, the next generation because, wow. because yeah, because my cousin, <laughs> uh, my cousin, uh, 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 David Titcher, David Nathaniel Titcher, who wrote the, uh, wrote the rewrite, uh, not the rewrite, but uh, did the remake of Around the World in, in 80 Days, the Jackie Chan film. He wrote that script. That was probably his most famous script. Um, uh, he uh, had an agent and the two of us kind of, you know, he was able to get that script in there. Of course, it didn't get produced. Although I swear that I saw a scene that beat for beat was my scene. And you know, they, call, you know, they, were, they sometimes referred to, to those rejected spec scripts as the slush pile, and they would grab, they would grab scenes. No, nah, that's fine. That's, you know, I, I work in the business. I, I, uh, I, I'm, if you worry about that, then, then you shouldn't be in that business. And I, I, that's not because I think that people steal your work, but because, because I don't believe that ideas are that original, that there, that there aren't that many original ideas. Well, the satisfying thing is doing the writing, not so much expecting Bingo. it to be produced. It's right? the process, exactly. <laughs> if you don't enjoy the writing, then then you can't. Then the the result will not please you, or the outcome, you know, the success of it will not will not please you. Well, more proof, Brian, of the many the diversity of your career and your life, and how how much richness that has brought to you. So. Just a great conversation, your book. We could have gone into so many different areas, but you gave us just wonderful ideas on, on yes, the importance of teamwork and having empathy and 
you know, being leaders that care about our people and, and finding their superpowers. So thank you so much for, for coming on our show. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for giving me a chance to talk about teamwork. And, uh, and uh, this was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. You have just been listening to our interview with Brian Goldman, staff physician at Sinai Health System, host of White Coat Black Heart on CBC Radio 1, and the CBC podcast, The Dose. For more information about HEROC and to listen to past episodes of Healthcare Changemakers, go to our website, HEROC.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. You can hear more episodes of Healthcare Changemakers on our website, HEROC.com, and on your favorite podcasting apps. If you like what you hear, please rate us or post a review. Healthcare Changemakers is recorded by HEROC's communications and marketing team and produced by Podfly Productions. Follow us on Twitter at at HEROC Group or email us at communications at HEROC.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.